We welcome you all this evening to our Wednesday night Bible class. Before we begin, I wanted to call attention to a good friend of mine, Brother Omari French. He surprised me this week. He showed up unexpectedly to the office. He is a good friend from San Francisco. He preaches there at the Uptown Church of Christ in San Francisco. And if for some reason you do find yourself in that particular area, I highly recommend the congregation, a sound congregation in San Francisco. Who would have thought? But we're so thankful that the Lord has given him safe travels and he is here with us this evening. I believe he's planning to leave on tomorrow. But without further delay, let's go ahead and focus our attention on the Bible class this evening. We are continuing our discussion on how to study the Bible. Scripture since the intelligent comprehension of God's Word. And what we have been doing, we've been trying to make that which is complex, practical, easier to understand. And what we mean by this, it is a study of hermeneutics. Now I know that when we talk about the word hermeneutics, sometimes we might get a little bit um, discouraged because it's one of those $50 words and we think to ourselves, Bible study shouldn't be this difficult. But as we pointed out from the very beginning, the word hermeneutics is actually found within the Greek of the New Testament. And the word exegesis is also found in the Greek of the New Testament. And so what we were trying to do was trying to comprehend how the Bible demonstrates we ought to study God's word. So we've reached this point of the class where we are now going over the rules of interpretation. If you were able to get your hands on one of the workbooks that we printed out just a few weeks ago, you will notice that the rules are outlined in the chapter that you have available. And so these are the rules that we've been discussing and that we have also been uh, demonstrating through use of some videos. Now, typically, I would have the ability to share my screen and perhaps go a little slower, or if the screen perhaps would be a little larger. But in order to try to make this class successful, what we have done is we've recorded videos. And please let me know your feedback in the future if we should continue doing this type of demonstration, if this was beneficial, or if you could see the screen or not see the screen. But let's go ahead and refresh our memory on the rules that we've been discussing so far. So rule number one, as we approach the scriptures, let's say we were given a passage to study. The elders have asked us to give a devotional. Or if you are a lady, one of the ladies have asked you to teach a class for the ladies' class. What are you going to do? How are you going to approach this Bible study in preparation? Well, rule number one would suggest before interpreting a passage, determine who is speaking, the recipients, the time of writing, the purpose of writing, and the type of composition. Now, all I've done is I have brought all of these rules together into one main rule, and this is an introductory approach to any passage or any book that you are seeking to study. And so in the last class periods, we actually went into some of the study material to demonstrate how we could do this. Now, if you don't have a digital application, such as what we have seen on the screen, you can always purchase books. You can find some of these books that we have referenced, perhaps at a half-price bookstore. I believe there's one near uh, Keller or at a Barnes & Noble. Or nowadays, you can order them on the internet. And books, of course, they make for an excellent library where you can actually spread them out on your kitchen table. You'll need somewhere large. But a digital library would be easier if you're more familiar with that type of technology. And so this would make 
this rule agrees to actually sift through all of the information as you will have the books right at your fingertip, as they say. So we demonstrated these rules before interpreting the passage, determine the speaker, the recipients, the time of writing, the purpose writing, and the type of composition. We also saw rules two and three. A correct text of a passage must be obtained before it is interpreted. Going beyond just a preparation or an introduction, now we are looking at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And if you have a particular passage under consideration, you would want to turn to that to, uh, in a translation that you are familiar with. But as we went over the rules in trying to discover how we should approach it, one of the rules suggested a correct text of a passage must be obtained before it is interpreted. As you all know, there are different translations. There are different versions of the Bible. And so therefore, it requires us to be familiar with these different translations and how they are used or what kind of background they are coming from before we actually begin to study the text. Now, Typically, you're going to find that many of the translations will translate the passage or several passages very similar. But on occasion, there will be differences of words. And I have found that on some key passages, there are differences of words. Much like 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, where we're talking about baptism. And the phrase in the King James Version, it says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. In the New International Version, it would make reference to uh, a pledge, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but a pledge of a good conscience toward God. In the New American Standard Version, it would have the word appeal, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the appeal of a good conscience toward God. And so if you were to just stop and look at those three translations, answer, pledge, appeal, immediately you begin to see how there is a significant change in the word that is being used. And so that's just an illustration that will show us rule number two's importance. A correct text of a passage must be obtained before it is interpreted. And so if a translation is used, it must be an exact equivalent of the original language and note the difference. Now, I know many of us are not familiar with the Greek language or the Hebrew language, but we do have study helps that can assist us in these things. There are interlinear Bibles. If you haven't uh, become familiar with these, these are pretty good. It will give you the text, the biblical text, in the English. And the interlinear Bible will follow along in the Greek language every English word in the Greek language. And a good one will even give you the Strong's numbers that are associated with it. Now, when I make reference to the Strong's numbers, we referenced this uh, in the last class period, that in the Bible dictionaries and the lexicons, they have coded these Hebrew words, these Greek words with Strong's numbers to make it more accessible, to be easier for the common reader to flip through these books and to find definitions of words. And so even though we may not be familiar with Hebrew or Greek, there are study helps available that can help us, though we have a limited knowledge. And so rule number three, if a translation is to be used, it must be an exact equivalent of the original language or the interpreter must note the difference. For instance, in 1 Peter 3.21, answer, appeal, or uh, pledge, we note the difference. And perhaps in our Bible study, we might even be writing out question marks. Why is there a difference in the way the translators use this word? And as we further go on to study, we will realize that this might be because of some of the theological differences with the interpreters and how they approached the Bible and their translation. But moving on, we've spoken about this. We have also talked about rules four, five, and six. The history and original meaning of a word should be used instead of the current usage. 
So in the booklet, if you're following along, this would be uh, part three. This would be the part, or part four, one of the others. This would be the part that you would start to give definition of terms. So you would go to these lexicons or these Bible dictionaries, and based upon the key words that you have uh, born out of the text, you would begin to define each word and write the notes, write where you found them, so that in the event that you are questioned or asked about the definition, you know where to turn. You know the book that you got it from, the information that you retrieved. Carefully note distinctions between synonymous terms. We illustrated this last time we talked about this in discussing the word sin. In the Hebrew Old Testament, you're going to find that sin, there are various synonyms. Iniquity, transgression, sin. Three terms that make reference to the same concept. They are part of the same word family, but are different in their application, helping us to understand the nuanced differences of our disobedience. And we spoke in detail about that at rule number five. In rule number six, we talked about expressions and words must be interpreted considering the context. So when you begin defining words, I didn't mention this um, a lot last Wednesday, but when you begin defining words using Bible dictionaries or lexicons, you're going to find out that sometimes these words have different senses. They have different uses. And so the lexicon in the Bible dictionary will outline the different senses for you, and then it will be up to you as the interpreter to try to figure out which sense should be applied to the word that is being used. And so the context will help you determine that. Let me give you an example. In the book of Ephesians chapter five and verse 19, I've made reference to this before in lessons past, but there the Bible teaches us to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Well, that word melody, if you go to the Greek language, it's going to be the Greek word solo. And if you go to a Greek lexicon, you're going to find different senses of the word. At the very basic and fundamental definition, it would say to pluck, to twang. And that's all the first sense will give you. And then if you continue reading in some of these lexicons, they will add to pluck or twang as of an instrument. But here is where you will begin to determine which sense is to be used. Well, rule number six, expressions and words must be interpreted considering the context. Well, in Ephesians chapter five and verse 19, the context there would tell us what is being plucked and what is being twanged. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So singing and twanging or plucking in your heart to the Lord. So the context will help you determine that the sense there is not making reference to an instrument because nothing in the context would have reference to the plucking of an instrument. Now I realize that the context there is making reference to making melody. I realize it has reference to singing, but there is not a word there that would be suggestive of playing or using an instrument. And if you were to go out and branch further into the greater context, the remote context of the New Testament, you're going to find that nowhere in the New Testament actually are you going to find the suggestion of the use of instruments of music. And so the expression and the word will be interpreted considering the immediate context and the remote context. And sometimes when you're studying the Bible and defining these words, there's going to be different senses of the word. Now this is just a basic illustration. There are many other situations that you're going to find yourself studying the Bible and trying to figure out which sense should be applied. Talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about the word death, 
the word Lord. All of these different words come into play and the senses and the context are going to be crucial for trying to determine which word should be used. So we talked a little bit about that last class period as we demonstrated through the videos, uh, the history, the original meaning, noting distinctions, and interpreting based upon the context. So looking now tonight, we want to consider rule seven, eight, and nine. And this is going to be part four in your workbook. If you were following along, this would be page 18. <clears throat> and so we're going to play a video that will demonstrate these rules. When interpreting a sentence, always interpret according to the known purpose of the author. Due weight must be given to emphatic words in the sentence. Help may be given by examining the statements of other writers on the same subject of equal authority. Now in rule number nine, when we say help may be given by examining the statements of other writers, we're talking about remote contexts in the Bible itself. I know that sometimes when we are studying a passage and it might be difficult for us, we might be tempted to go to a commentary and we are seeking the commentary to shed some light on the passage that we are reading. Now, the commentaries may be useful from time to time, but they are not of equal authority. The commentator would be a man who is not inspired. He may be educated. He may be well-versed in the scriptures, but he is not of equal authority. So when we say help may be given by examining the statements of other writers on the same subject of equal authority, we're talking about if we're trying to understand the Apostle Paul, well, let's go to the Apostle John. If we're trying, trying to understand what Peter wrote, the Apostle Peter, well, then perhaps we'll consider what one of the prophets said. And so they are of equal authority, seeing that these men wrote equally by inspiration. And that's what we mean when we say of equal authority. Help may be given by examining the statements of other writers on the same subject of equal authority. And in that statement, we will say, we let the Bible interpret itself. The Bible is its own best interpreter. And I have found this to be true in all my years of Bible study. There's going to be passages that sometimes will have you scratching your head having you bow down in prayer, asking the Lord for understanding. But as you continue studying the scriptures, you're going to find that the Bible is its own best interpreter. We just have to pay attention. And in this case, defining words, interpreting sentences, and putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. So let's see if we can illustrate this by a video. Um, now this is the part of Bible study that sometimes takes longer. The first few parts that I showed you were pretty easy. You wanna look up the recipient, the author, the time of writing. You go to these lexicons and they will take you right to these subject matters. Study the book of Romans. Look at the introductory material. And it's easy reading, quick reading. If you're going to consider the various translations, that's an easy exercise. Get out a few different translations and compare the verse. It's quick. But when you start getting into part number four that we're gonna look at tonight, this is where it starts to take a little longer because if we're going to pursue what we demonstrated a few classes back, the inductive method is going to require us to look at every passage that the Bible has to offer on a particular verse or a topic or a word. And so we'll illustrate this this evening. Let me see if I can play it from here. Yes, yes. there it goes. So if you take the time to write out the definitions, it would look something like that. And as you flipped over to the next page, now preparing for part number four, rules for interpreting sentences. You just want to become familiar with the rules as we've already talked about them. Always interpret according to the known purpose of the author. That's one thing you want to keep in mind. 
what was the original intent. And so sometimes the speaker will state just what he wanted to accomplish by speaking. He will tell you at the outset why he's writing, why he's discussing the subject, or the context of the book should be carefully considered. And so sometimes if the author does not tell you, well then it's going to require you, as some of you all mentioned in the past, for you to sit down and maybe read the book itself in its entirety. Read the chapter, read the chapter before, read the chapter after. Or otherwise, consider the rest of the sentence due weight given to emphatic words. Or examining the statements of other authors. So now the directions of this exercise, using a study Bible, a concordance, or a topical Bible, record the scripture references that match. <clears throat> so if you are looking at the page here, you're going to see three different types of exercises, by verse, by keyword, or by topic. So here we are, we come to the Bible, we're looking at Romans chapter five and verse 12, and if you are, uh, let's see if I can pause it here. If you are using a Bible, more than likely, you're going to find that your Bible has study notes, footnotes. If you're reading through your Bible, sometimes you'll see a little A, a little B, or a little letter in the alphabet, or a number. Well, this is the equivalent of it, what you're seeing on the screen. My digital Bible has these little numbers. I tap on them. It's just like you looking at these small letters and cross-referencing the verse with the Bible itself. Now, there are some Bible publishers that do a great job, and you won't necessarily have to invest money on something greater because some of these Bible publishers have taken um, this to a whole new level of Bible study, giving the, the reader and the student more information at their fingertips. So this is what I'm doing here. I tapped on the footnote. And the footnote gave me several different scripture references. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 being one of them. If I were to turn my Bible there quickly, I would say or read, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, that sounds like a, a pretty good verse. Well, wait a minute. Let's see here. Thing it may re restart it. David, do you think you can fast forward that a little bit? Well, that, that might seem like a pretty good verse if you're following along in the notes. And uh, you'd want to go ahead and just flip back over and write down this information, write down the verse uh, that would correlate with it. I think that might be the next video already. So it gets a little tricky with these videos, especially with the different uh, slides. Sometimes you think you're on the same video, but it may not be the same video. So it should be the first slide with the video that we're looking at. So if you're on page 18, Notice there where it says, biblical cross-reference by verse. <clears throat> and so the question, or rather the statement is made, write other verses relating to Romans 5.12. Well, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 would have been one of those verses. Because Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 would have given you some insight. We were looking at Romans 5.12, where the Bible showed us that sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death spread to all men because all have sinned. And so what we were doing is going back to the original context of when this occurred, Genesis 2.17. So this would definitely be a key verse to consider. Why? Because 2.17 is the original commandment that God gave. Where there, he explained you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you shall surely die. There was the warning given. And we know how the narrative unfolds. 
Adam and Eve, Eve was deceived, she ate of the fruit, and as a result, sin entered into the world, and death passed or spread to all men, because all men have sinned. So Genesis 2.17, if you're writing in your notes, page 18, that would definitely be one verse to consider. One verse to consider. Then if you were still tapping on some of those footnotes, then you might want to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, and Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. Because now that's going to give you the actual situation that occurred. The actual situation that occurred. <clears throat> this is where they ate of the fruits. And the Bible says their eyes were opened. And so if you turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, you're also going to find that God pronounces this consequence, this judgment. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So here we go, we're back here, looking at the footnote. And the point I'm simply making is, if you have a good study Bible, you can rely on some of these study helps, where you can tap on it, if you have a digital version, or you can search the scriptures if you have just the book version in front of your, uh, in front of your, or, or in your hands, I should say. Is it pause or was it playing again? Go ahead and play it again. Appreciate it. So this is what you would do just on a basic level. Uh, perhaps you're sitting down in the middle of a Bible class or in a sermon and the preacher mentions a verse that you may be familiar with and um, you want to know more about it. Well. If you're flipping through the scriptures, you might look at that passage and it might have these footnotes. <clears throat> and so therefore you begin to go on this wild goose hunt, hoping that you can still catch what the lesson's about. But I found myself sometimes in the middle of a sermon, hearing a verse, and then looking at other passages. Well, you would write these verses down. Now you're doing this because you're trying to gather all the information that's available so that in the end, you can have a better grasp of the verse that you're studying. So you go back and you look at the other verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 will give you a good indication that by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. All right, that's gonna be a good verse for me to consider in light of this text. And uh, you will continue to look at the verse itself. Maybe you'll come across the word death. And death will have some footnotes in reference to it. But then there are other helps. There's a book called Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. Maybe you've heard of it. Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. These are pretty easy to find. You can find them many times at Half Price Bookstore. Or you can order them on Amazon. <clears throat> and what I like about this book is that it breaks down the entire Bible by verse. And as you see on the screen, looking at verse 12, it'll give you verses that are related to that particular verse. And all you would have to do is turn to each passage. If you have a digital version, all you have to do is tap on it. And it'll give you more verses that are associated with the verse that you're looking at. So I just found Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I think that would be a good verse to put in uh, my knowledge, in my memory, and so we would write it down. So there's going to be a variety of other passages that you come across. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, you may remember there that that's where God is talking about the soul that sins shall die. And here in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, you actually have this reference, the soul dies. Is that what God was talking about in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17? 
Is that what Paul is referencing here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12? Well, that might be another verse under consideration. And so you would write that passage down. Also, I think I got a little ahead of myself in the video, but Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all men have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. That's also a good verse to consider relative to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. So I think for the most part, this will give you some indication of what you could use. Nowadays, you have study Bibles that have these footnotes that will give you a ready reference. Or if you're at home and you have um, the access to the treasury of scripture knowledge, you can open up this book, look up the verse, and then consider all the verses that are associated with that particular verse. So I know the video is going to play out here. Any questions or comments that anybody might have at this moment? So this is what I mean by it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. This is where you're going to uh, outline for yourself an hour of time. I'm going to spend an hour here doing this Bible study, going back and forth, flipping to the scriptures, to and from. There has been many times, especially when I've done study, extensive study, like on the subject of the Holy Spirit. I literally spent all nighters going back and forth, looking at the exact same scriptures over and over and over, defining words, going and cross-referencing again, and then trying to organize the thoughts. This is what it requires sometimes when you're studying the Bible and you're trying to grasp the meaning of God's word. But here's the danger and here's the temptation. We don't have that time. We gotta get up in the morning for work or our child is crying and we gotta go and attend to them or we have to spend some time with our spouse. Very important, especially on a day like this. And we have to sit with them and it takes away from our time. And so the danger and the temptation is, if we've been called or asked to give a devotional or a Bible study, we just throw a few verses together and really don't have any depth of understanding. We don't really grasp it. We saw a few verses that look good, they seem to connect, and so we wrote them down and we didn't do much with them. Well, cross-referencing is going to be the heart of your Bible study. You can learn the speaker, the recipients, the time of writing, you can consider the translations, you can define the words, but if you wanna get a good grasp of what the Bible says of the subject overall, this is where the bulk of your time is going to be uh, spent. This passage by so many is, is trying to be twisted to think that uh, original sin has been inherited by every man, when in fact, these cross-references in, in the context itself will tell you that is not true. We do not inherit original sin. Sin was originated with the first man, Adam. And so it is helpful just to kind of uh, tie a knot on that and, and understand that Little babies are as innocent as can be, and the soul that sins, it shall die. Mm -hmm. We don't inherit this, this uh, sin, uh, but uh, our friend, our forefather Adam, he sure made things difficult, and death was introduced because of it. Correct. Very good thoughts. And so right now, when you're gathering all this information, your mind's going to be racing with all of these ideas and all these conclusions. And that's why you want to write them down so that you can go back and revisit the verse, restudy the verse and other verses. Because once you gather all this information, there might be other difficult verses like this one, Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinned the dot shall die. You're going to have to exegete that verse. Well, what does it mean by the soul? How does the soul sin? And what does it mean that the soul dies? There are even other, other doctrines that are built on that concept of the soul dying. 
So it's gonna take some time, but based on what your goal and what your end is, you're just trying to gather all the information so that eventually you can sift through these again at a future date. So let's go ahead and move on to our second video, which will demonstrate these rules even further. Now, if you notice, as I was looking at the verses and cross-referencing cross verses that were related to Romans 5.12, I saw that there was a good one that was based upon a key word. So I went ahead and wrote James 1, 14 and 15 there because it was associated with the key word. Let me see if I can play it from here. If not, maybe David or Joe, can you press play on that next video? So in this next section, by keyword, this is where some of the Bibles, I've noticed newer publishings of the Bible don't have a concordance like they used to. When I was growing up, you could buy a Bible and in the back of the Bible, there would be a concordance. Now, it may not have been exhaustive, but it gave you a pretty good concordance on the different words. Nowadays, they've completely eliminated the concordance, maybe because of lack of space. I don't know what the issue is, but this is where your concordance will come into play if you're going to try to study the Bible by key words. So in this verse, two key words are going to be sin and death. Sin and death. And uh, you want to open up your concordance now. Strong's has a concordance. If you've seen it, it's about this thick. It's very heavy. And the lettering is very tiny. So you might have to get out your magnifying glass for that. But if you have a digital library, um, you can see that there's an opportunity where you can just type the word in and immediately it'll pull up all the verses that are associated with a particular key word. So this would be the second slide with the video. The second slide with the video. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to demonstrate without seeing the video, the uh, concordance. But in my Bible program, I can slide over to a search I can type in the word sin, and then it will give me hundreds of verses that you will find in that particular uh, book or the entire Bible. Here you're going to see in just a moment. And this is where investing some money in a good Bible program might come into play. I know that sometimes we might not want to spend a couple hundred dollars, and yes, a couple hundred dollars, the Bible program that I have was a couple thousand dollars. But if you invest into a digital program like this, you do have a good help. So I just typed in the word sin, and I'm gonna show you that there's about 763 results uh, in this particular uh, search. <clears throat> now this is going to be Time-consuming, 763 results, time-consuming. Well, immediately I found the very first verse, which was Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. If you will, go ahead and turn to that, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. We're going to go ahead and just let this play out and we'll catch back up to it. But Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, it's interesting that the first time you see the word sin being used in all the Bible is a verse demonstrating that sin can be conquered. I think we forget that. I think in the denominational world, when they start talking about sin, they talk about it in such a fashion as if it is so powerful, and we're not trying to make light of it, but that it is so powerful it is unconquerable. And so they've come up with doctrines like total depravity, like Myron was making reference to the passing on of sin. But Genesis chapter four and verse seven, the very first time that sin is being referenced in the Bible, this is what it's saying. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and desires, and its desires for you, but you should 
rule over it. That's God speaking to Cain and telling Cain, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. But I'm telling you as your creator, you have the capability of ruling over sin. So you would write that down in these notes because it would be a good passage to keep in your memory if you're going to give a lesson on it or a Bible study on it. As you saw me, I was continually scrolling through the concordance. I came across Exodus chapter 29, where you're going to find some of the first references as to sin necessitating a sacrifice. So I wrote down Genesis 29 because I showed there that God is giving instruction on how to atone for sin in the Old Testament through sacrifice. Well, that would definitely be a good passage to put down. Now here, as I continued scrolling through my concordance, I would have come across Exodus chapter 32, verses 21 and following. And the reason why this particular verse is, is interesting because here, this verse will show us that whoever sins against the Lord will be blot out of the book. And you might even want to cross-reference there some of the verses that are being used because it might be interesting. But you look at the verse, I will blot him out of my book, whoever sins against me. So this is the reason why sin is so damaging. Yes, it causes us to die, but now we're getting a little bit more information. A person who sins is going to be blot out of God's book. And then that begs the question, well, what book? I didn't even know there was a book. And that might cause you to begin chasing a rabbit. Well, what does the Bible say about some book that God is keeping? It might lead you to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16, that a book of remembrance was kept for those who spoke often on the name of the Lord. It might lead you to the book of Revelation chapter 20 about not having your name found in the book of life. And that's why a verse like this in your search by keyword comes into play. So you're going to continue scrolling through your concordance. Uh, you're going to find different words, different verses, 763 verses. And yes, God is asking you to look up every verse. I know it's time consuming, but it's necessary. If you're going to stand here at the pulpit for a sermon, a Bible class, or for a ladies class, ladies in your respective areas, you want to make sure that you have considered all that the Bible says so that you can speak with confidence. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that in the event someone might ask you a question, you may not have full comprehension, but at least you know where to point them. Well, I recall a verse here that I was studying and it came across. And therefore, you're going to go to passages like this. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 25 in your concordance search would have been another good one. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who shall intercede for him? Hmm. Now this passage is showing us that sin is against God. And if we sinned against God, well then, who's going to intercede on our behalf? Now you're starting to see a big and fuller picture of sin. It might be that you want to just focus on a particular book. Um, I don't know if it's in this same video. I think that's the end of the video. But we'll go ahead and forego it. But you might want to just make a concordance search on the book of Psalms, because the Psalms has a lot to say about the word sin. And you might come across uh, Psalm 32. Notice in your Bibles, Psalm 32. Let me see here. And notice verse four. I'm sorry, verse 5. In Psalm 32 and verse 5, you're going to find one of the rules demonstrated. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
So if you did a concordance search just in the book of Psalms, you would have come across this passage, and then this passage would have been enlightening, showing you all three synonyms being used together. And how at the end, he says, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And remember, we were talking about the word iniquity made reference to rebellion and utter rejection. And so at the end, he says, you forgave me of my rebellion of my missing the mark or the standard. So going back to the workbook, if you're following along, you can also go to a topical Bible. I don't know how much time we have left, but if you can go to the last slide with the last video, I don't think we're going to have time. I just wanted to show you that there are books. There is a book entitled The Topical Textbook of the Bible. And this particular book will give you every topic of the Bible by verse. And so in the book that I have, a new topical textbook, I can just look up the word death. And then by the topic, it begins to give me a good breakdown in an outline. It's necessary as a consequence of sin. It's the wages of sin. It's the portion of the wicked. It's described. It's uh, self-righteousness leads to death. God alone inflicts death. It's described as banishment from God, society with the devil, a lake of fire, a worm that dies not, outer darkness. And so you're going to go through a host of scriptures on a topic, and then you're going to begin writing them down to see which ones would be uh, interesting and necessary for your study. I hope that this was somewhat enlightening. I know it's a little difficult the way we're kind of doing it, but I wanted to give you just some idea so that you can picture in your mind how Bible study should look like. When you go home and you're studying your Bible for yourself, you might be asking yourself, am I doing it right? Am I using the tools? This is how it would look, just like something like this. And then you begin to write down these verses and you'll have uh, information for future reference. Well, I believe that was the second bell. Any last questions or comments? Biblehub.com? All right, there's another one, eSword. Used to be free. I think they might uh, charge for it. There's blueletterbible.com. There's a lot of resources available. And uh, in this age of technology, we should make ourselves, uh, we should avail ourselves to those helps. Well, let's go ahead and end with a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the blessings that we enjoy. And we pause for this brief moment at the end of our study to honor and to glorify thee, to remember your Son. We pray, Father, that as we consider this subject, that we will take it with great importance, knowing that this is how you have communicated with us. And even though there may be obstacles, we pray that we might do the work to overcome those barriers so that we can comprehend your will and live an obedient life. Be with us now as we go our separate ways and forgive us of our sins. It is through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.